family, my name is MacArthur, entertainer, broadcaster, weekend philosopher, and colossal nerd. You know those days where you feel just downright uninspired, like you lack creativity, motivation, and enthusiasm for the things that you're normally passionate about, or possibly even that you do for a living? Do you feel guilty because you know you should be doing these things, but you simply can't because your hands are duct taped to giant anvils and your skull is full of wet cement? Well, as anyone who's experienced this will tell you, it's about as much fun as making love to a pinecone, and you do that for long enough and you'll start to ask yourself some fairly serious questions. What's going on here? What caused this unpleasant state of affairs? How long will it last? Am I ever going to get my inspiration back? Is there anything I can do about it? And perhaps most importantly, Am I really in some mysterious creative void, or am I just being lazy or procrastinating? Well, I've been thinking deeply about these questions lately, and I'm just coming out of one of these phases myself. And it's not the first time in my life, so I wanted to expand on this topic and let you know what I've come up with so far. But in order to do that with any sort of brevity, this bizarre phenomenon is going to need a name. I've heard musicians refer to it as the downtimes, I've heard authors refer to it as writer's block, but I'm starting to notice that this happens to more people than just artists or creative types. It happens to most of us in one form or another, so we're going to need a different name for it. I was thinking of calling it Silence of the Muse, mostly because I'm a huge dork, but also because it's extremely relevant, and we're going to find out exactly how later in the video, but first I want to talk a little bit about creativity, or perhaps in this context, inspiration would be a better word. Well, one thing's for sure, it's mysterious. So where does it come from? Why is it so unpredictable? Here one day and gone the next. Why do some people seem to have it a little bit more than others? Well, the truth is that we don't really know, but what we do know is that inspiration allows us to create fantastic works of art, science, and engineering that are so far beyond the abilities of the average human being, and possibly our own average abilities, that they seem almost superhuman. We also know that it's beyond our control. We can't decide to become inspired, and we can't choose what we're inspired about. It seems to come from beyond us somehow. And it seems to strike at random like in the middle of the night or while you're brushing your teeth. Unfortunately, it also seems to leave us at random. And this really sucks for some people more than others because it turns out that inspiration is absolutely vital for some professions, while for others it might not be so important. For example, if I was a plumber or a construction worker, I could probably force myself to get up and go to work in the morning whether or not I was feeling inspired. But for those of us involved in more creative activities and professions, things might not be that easy. So when we consider its mysterious and unpredictable nature, as well as its power, perhaps it's not so difficult to understand how certain ancient civilizations considered inspiration to be of divine origin. Which brings us to the name we've chosen to describe these unpleasant periods of low creativity. So, what exactly do we mean when we use the word muse? Well, as it turns out, we mean a whole lot of things. The word is a fascinating one, and it refers to a concept that predates history itself, and yet is more relevant to our lives today than most people are aware of. So I think it's worth starting at the beginning. When using it in this context, the word refers to the nine muses of Greek mythology, the beautiful daughters of mighty Zeus himself and you could think of them as the goddesses of creativity. Each of the nine sisters had a specialty, and was responsible for doling out all the inspiration for that particular field. There was a muse for art, poetry, and music, but also for some less artistic pursuits, such as astronomy, history, and philosophy, showing us once again that creativity comes in many forms. They represented the angels of inspiration, the spirits or higher beings that are the source of all creativity in the universe. In fact, according to this principle, all of our finest work comes from them, not us. And we lowly mortals are just instruments, specialized tools which can give form and substance to their creations. And this is such a cool idea to me, because 
from the perspective of the ancient Greeks, when we consider the erratic, unpredictable way in which inspiration behaves, it's not unreasonable to think of it like it's being controlled from some external force. This sort of philosophy would be difficult for many people to swallow today, simply because it leaves very little room for ego. But personally, I mean, even looking at this concept metaphorically, I find this whole idea that inspiration comes from something far greater than ourselves to be not only useful, but liberating and actually quite relaxing. It removes some of the feeling of responsibility that we have concerning our work, and also enables us to trust our own creative instincts a little bit more. This added boost of confidence might be why the Greeks were so prolific with art, science, literature, engineering, and so much more. But the ideas expressed by this metaphor continued to evolve throughout the centuries. In some representations, this concept of the muse has a more personalized touch often appearing in dreams or visions as a sort of guardian angel or friendly spirit that chooses some poor unsuspecting artist or craftsman to do their bidding sometimes for life, which is usually accomplished by whispering incessantly into the ear of their unfortunate instruments, or sometimes by singing or literally breathing creativity directly into a human being uh, during a kiss, for example which is a situation that may have been more comfortable for some than others, but either way, this is part of a repeating theme that I find fascinating for reasons that will become a little more clear later on. In most cases, this type of muse seems to have its own unique appearance, character, and disposition, and examples of this have been expressed beautifully in art and poetry throughout history. In more practical terms, a muse could be a character that you created in your own imagination, just so you have a face to picture in your mind when you're desperately praying for your professional salvation. As the idea has evolved over the centuries, apparently so has the word, and I suppose that's not surprising. After all, language is about symbols, and symbols in some cases can teach us more about reality than we ever could learn in one lifetime's experience. And perhaps as a result, this particular symbol has worked its way into our modern vocabulary in some interesting ways. Despite its obvious influences on English words like music, amusement, and museum, it's also used in one form or another in a variety of languages to describe a variety of different things, situations, and circumstances. As a noun, it can be used, of course, to describe a divine mythological being like we've been discussing, but also it can be used to describe a source of inspiration of any kind. In some languages, it also refers to a mouth, a portal, a gateway, or any kind of opening. As a verb, it can mean to daydream, to speculate, to contemplate, or to think whimsically. Now, after thinking about all of these definitions and comparing them for a while, what stood out for me most was perhaps this association with the mouth and with portals and gateways and openings. That's because in many mythologies, using the mouth is the preferred method by the gods for bringing their creations to life, from the first human beings to the universe itself. Perhaps it's no coincidence, then, that the word inspire is derived from the Latin inspirare, which means, literally, to breathe into, to blow into, or to fill up. Apparently, our ancestors realized long ago that pure creativity is not native to the conscious mind, or at least it doesn't behave that way, but rather is blown into us by something far greater than ourselves, whatever that might be. So why am I telling you all of this? How can a bunch of vague historical and linguistic references possibly help us in our daily lives? Because we might never be able to put our finger on exactly what inspiration is or where it comes from, but nearly 3,000 years of literature can tell us a great deal about how it behaves, about how it acts and reacts in certain situations. And like many of life's mysteries, that is all that is required to unlock its secrets. 
Here's what I mean. We don't have to fully understand how something works in order to benefit from it or even to harness it. We just need enough information to predict its behavior to a certain degree. For example, I don't fully understand how gravity works, but I figured out quickly that if I climb up onto my roof and I jump off, I will most certainly hit the ground. And this turned out to be pretty useful information over the course of my life and has helped me avoid doing this on purpose for the last 30 years or so. As a species, we've harnessed gravity to assist us in a myriad of other endeavors as well, such as disposing of our enemies with concrete shoes or sending probes to other planets. And we still barely understand how gravity works. Now, we didn't harness forces like this by understanding. We did it by simple observation which sometimes does lead to understanding as a consequence. Well, luckily for us, people have been observing creativity for a very long time, and all of that wisdom lies buried within layers of myth and metaphor from ages long past. To spare you the pain of reading scrolls in a basement by candlelight for the next century or so, I've condensed a bit of this ancient wisdom into five simple steps which can help us deal with these situations in a healthy manner and to get through them as quickly and painlessly as possible. Even if you are a more pragmatic person and you think that inspiration is simply a random chemical accident that occurs in the brain, I'm willing to bet the following solutions will work as well for you as they did the ancient Greeks. Simply consider the word muse as a metaphor for the part of your brain responsible for creativity, and I think you'll find these methods just as effective. Number one, rest, reflect, and recover. The muses might be able to provide us with inspiration, but when it comes to our health and our happiness, we're kind of on our own. So get some rest and take a little bit of time, maybe a day to look around at your life, and see if there's anything going on that you can change that might be making things worse. For example, are you in a bad living situation? Are you in a job that you hate? Maybe you have some unhealthy habits that aren't helping. Uh, look at this stuff and see if there's uh, anything you can do to just make sure that you're not making it more difficult for the muses to work through you, because that has happened to me in the past and to plenty of other people I know. If you notice anything in your life that could use changing, set it aside for a moment. Remember, we're supposed to be resting here, not beating ourselves up and feeling guilty. Our only purpose at this moment is to notice these things because they will help us with our feelings of confusion and lack of direction. The more we know about the situation, the easier it's going to be to handle it. So, according to these ancient philosophies, humans are obviously incredibly valuable to the muses because we're the only way that they can interact with the physical world. But we are still instruments, just mere tools of the divine, metaphorically speaking, uh, if nothing else. And the muses will treat us in much the same way as we would treat a valuable tool. For example, if a tool wears out, breaks, or has served its purpose for the moment, the muses will put it back in the toolbox and grab a different one. That same creativity will then be expressed through another person somewhere else. So don't make the muses put you back in the toolbox early, for it might be a while before they take you out again. Now at some point though, every tool needs a little TLC, so it continues to function properly. The muses know this as well as we do, so don't feel guilty, enjoy it. Because I'm a hopeless nerd, I prefer to look at it like this. Let's say you're a starship captain, and you've been frolicking about the galaxy, betting alien strippers and starting wars. Well, even the most hedonistic of captains is probably going to make time to take his starship back to space dock for a tune-up every now and then. You wouldn't just keep barreling through the universe at maximum warp until your starship fell apart around you. Then you'd find yourself stranded in deep space, feeling like an idiot. And there would be no more alien strippers, no more Romulan ale, no more bar fights with Klingons and random space stations. It would just be you, the universe, a broken starship, and a pissed off crew. Number two, listen to your muse. When both mind and body are at rest, the useless chatter that normally fills up our brains begins to quiet down a bit. If you listen carefully during these times, you might just be able to hear the muses whispering to you on the wind. 
but they might not be whispering words of inspiration. Uh, let me explain. If the muses create and control all inspiration, it's safe to say that they know things that we don't. They might be trying to tell you something. Maybe it's not a bad thing that you're going through this at this moment. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe you're on the wrong path. Maybe it's the wrong time. Maybe times have changed and the project that you wanted to finish is no longer relevant. Or maybe there's something even more important and inspiring and meaningful that you're meant to do at this moment. Or maybe your muse just needs a break. Number three, feed your muse. The muses might be divine, immortal beings, but even they get tired. Which isn't too surprising if you think about it, considering that in most creation stories, even the gods take days off. It would appear to me, even metaphorically speaking, that when it comes to inspiration, the muses, whatever they might be, are definitely running the show. But the longer I live, the more it seems to be a symbiotic relationship rather than a master-slave relationship. It's as if the muses need us as much as we need them. Personally, I must have the kindest, most patient muse in the universe, and she'll often play with me even when she's tired and doesn't want to, and I can kind of feel this. Because when I push her too far, or if I try to force a project without her inspiration, she gives me crap every time. Have you guys ever noticed this? At this point, if you've already followed steps one and two to your satisfaction, then it might just be the case that your muse is hungry, and as it turns out, it's not terribly difficult to feed them. Here's what I mean. If you're a musician and you've been unable to write music for a while, take some time off and listen to other people's music. And the same goes for any other skill, art, or profession. If you're a painter and you haven't been able to pick up the brush, go to an art gallery. If you're a writer and you've had writer's block, read a book. The idea is to look around and explore the world a bit. Look at how the muses have been working through other people. This can provide new inspiration, new fuel, and in some cases, the simple act of enjoying other people's creativity can solve the problem all on its own, for obvious reasons. Number four, try different things. Like playing the piccolo or wax sculpting replicas of your boss for sinister purposes. It doesn't necessarily have to be anything so off the wall or entertaining. For example, many of us have multiple skills, multiple passions, and many different things that we're good at. And this might be the perfect time to explore some of those. Let's use the story of the Nine Muses once again as a metaphor to clarify a bit. Just because one of the sisters is exhausted after months of using you as her personal blunt instrument of creativity, doesn't mean the rest of the sisters are. In fact, if one of them's exhausted, the others are probably bored and swinging from the chandeliers at this point, and maybe they'd like to play with you for a while. Or to put it in more practical terms, it's almost as if our brains have different categories for our various skills and talents, and each of these categories has its own fuel tank, so to speak. In my case, most of the work I've done in my life has involved performing of some type, whether it was performing live music, streaming, or even bartending. And a month or two ago, it became quite clear that that particular gas tank was empty. But after I decided to check in with my other passions and try a few different things that I hadn't done in a while, I was amazed to find that I was rich with inspiration. For example, writing became easier than it ever had been before while I was touring or playing live music. It was just pouring out of me effortlessly. And maybe this is an advantage of being a multi-class character, a jack-of-all-trades, somebody who is good at a lot of things, but not a master of any of them really, which would describe myself uh, pretty accurately. We have options, you know, we have, we have things that we can do to assist our muse, and that goes back to solution number three. You know, if you're a streamer and unable to broadcast, watch a stream instead. In this way, we can do our part to refill the gas tank we just drained, and sometimes we can do this while drawing from another gas tank. But don't take my word for it. Give this a try in your own life. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. 
And finally, number five, keep your bags packed. Nothing lasts forever, and it can be all too easy to get comfortable to give up and to settle in, especially because sometimes these periods seem like they last forever. But don't bother unpacking, because you want to be ready when the muse finally begins to speak to you again. One of the most common questions I hear about this topic is how do you know when you're really experiencing a silence of the muse, or if you're just being lazy and experiencing a rough time for some other reason. Well, this is one of the surefire ways to do that, and part of this is listening to your friends and family. Hang out with them, talk to them, spend time immersing yourself in outside points of view, because if anyone can tell when you're malfunctioning, it's probably them. Another great reason to keep your bags packed is that difficult times seem to behave a lot like a storm at sea. They build on the horizon, then they sweep in, destroy your life, and then they move away from you. Now, if we're not paying attention and if we allow ourselves to get too comfortable, sometimes we can miss the fact that a break in the weather is coming. We can see this if we're paying attention. Sometimes the muses will give you little signs that they're warming up to you again and about ready to say something profound. If you keep an eye on the sky and you notice this coming, there's all kinds of little things you can do to pave the way for the moment when the muses are ready again. That is to say, a guitar player might still restring his guitar and keep it in tune, even if he doesn't feel like playing. Just like a painter might still keep her brushes clean, even if she doesn't exactly feel inspired. And finally, don't be afraid to test the waters a little bit. Keep your nose to the wind. Every now and then, come up for air and check to see where your creativity stands. Pick up that guitar, pick up the paintbrush, and don't do so with any goal in mind. Don't jump right back into the project that was initially frustrating you. Just try to have a little fun. You will know when your powers of creativity have returned, when it becomes easy once again. When your craft flows from you without effort or strain, and you get that satisfied feeling in your belly that you get when you know you're contributing something beautiful to the world. If either you or the muses need more time to recover, trust me, they're gonna let you know. And so, my fellow instruments of creativity, those are a few practices that have helped me and many others that I know maximize their creativity and even thrive in its absence. If we take nothing else of value from this wisdom, let us remember this. If we follow our inspiration instead of our desires, if we listen to the muses just a little bit more than we listen to other people or even our own doubts and desperations, our desires themselves might be fulfilled in ways we never imagined. On that note, that's about as much coherent thought as I can muster in one day, and I get the feeling that my muse could use a break as well. So why don't you take it from here? Let us know about your experiences and thoughts concerning inspiration and the lack thereof in the comments section below. And if you're happy with what the muses have done at my expense, show them some love by hitting that subscribe button. Until next time, here's to new inspiration and new horizons.